Samantha Harding, and Mr. World's leading Cedric Price scholar. Uh, she uh, studied at the Architectural Association. Uh, in the 1990s, she founded a series of regenerative venues, uh, Crowbar Coffee. Um, she's worked with David Green of Archigram, uh, who uh, were themselves collaborators of Price at various stages on an exhibition and book. She teaches studio at the Architectural Association, and she's written or edited three of the major works on Cedric Price available, all of which uh, will eventually be in the shadow of what she's working on at the moment, which is uh, a complete work of Cedric Price. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. It will be tremendous when it comes out. Um, and tonight, she's going to give us her interpretation of uh, Cedric Price's pottery stink belt, which is the enormous steel train set that you've just seen next door. Uh, at the end, we hope that you'll join us in bar 10, just opposite the exit to the lighthouse, uh, for a celebratory drink to uh, drink goodbye to the exhibition in Glasgow. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, drink and please clap hello for the uh, Samantha. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. I hope I can live up to all of those. Uh, Accolade. Um, but uh, and thank you for inviting me to the lighthouse. It's um, it really is delightful to be here, and it, it's such a pleasure to see the exhibition. I'm glad to see it on the last day, um, and I'm sadly not having been able to get up here before. But to see the model, particularly the pottery stink belt, was um, I think if Cedric had walked into the room, it would have made him laugh, and uh, I think that was really the possibly not the object of the project itself, <laughs> but certainly um, by a means of communication, um, uh, jokes and wit were Cedric's um, me, bread and butter, really. That's how he, he, he got along. Um, so I hope, as a closing party, it should be somewhat of a celebration of that project, and also um, not a closing of the project at all, which in my mind is never closed, much like most of Cedric's projects. Um, the delight in the fact that he didn't build very much, which most people seem to take a great pleasure in, um, is sort of pointing a finger as, as an accusation that he really wasn't really up to much that he didn't build, uh, I think was really to his great benefit, actually, well, to the benefit of the rest of us, who um, he's left a, a legacy of an enormous amount of unfinished projects which can be revised and re-looked at and rethought, and that I think is exactly was and possibly is his intention um, for all of that work, that none of it was um, of his own, uh, for, his, for himself to keep, it was for other people to re-look at and rethink. So very much the ideas were the thing that were of um, importance. And really what then happened to them after that subsequently um, he was extremely generous and, and optimistic, I think, and hopeful that others would pick up. Um, he fully recognised that he was sufficiently incomplete as a human being that he, and as an architect that he was not capable of um, uh, undertaking and completing an entire project on his own. He was very, very dependent on working with others and um, of all sorts of skills and abilities. So. Um, I think, again, that's sort of reflected in his projects and, and the state in which they were left and often uh, unfinished, quite often because the relationship with the client tended to split, but that's another, another story um, for all sorts of reasons. But anyway, this is a picture of Cedric's closing party of his office in 2003, early 2003. So it was early in the year, just and the same year that he died. And he's sitting here with, um, no, 2002, I'm sorry, it was a year before he died. And he's sitting here with Joan Littlewood, who was his, um, the great uh, client of the Fun Palace. And so it's, um, I, I think it's a terrific picture, because actually there were others at the party, but you, wouldn't, you would never have known it. It was really a party for the two of them to say goodbye to that office, which um, Cedric occupied for 40 years in Store Street um, in central London. But this is the Cedric of the period in which we're largely going to talk about, or I will talk about um, in a little bit more detail. Um, and this was taken in 1966, so it's about the same time that the Pottery was published as a project. 
Um, I should probably explain that I'm in the middle, as Barbara said, I'm in the middle of um, compiling the complete works of Cedric's work. The entire archive resides in Canada at the Canadian Centre for Architecture, which you probably noticed from the multiple captions in the exhibition, um, that that's where all the work comes from. Uh, as a result, it's, um, I'm, I'm in this, th there's a lot of commuting, so when you go to Canada and you have uh, you just send acres and acres and acres of lists of numbers of drawings and you don't know what they are and they're just numbers, um, uh, then you, you, you do a sort of high-speed scanning of a lot, a lot of projects um, very quickly. So I am in this, currently in this mode of looking at all of Cedric's work, so it's quite strange all of a sudden to concentrate on one project again. Although Pottery's Think Belt itself is very close to my um, heart, really. It was the project that really made me think, uh, well, one, think twice why on earth I was studying architecture, um, and two, that I was quite glad I was, but I definitely wasn't most likely not going to be practicing. Um, I was in my second year at the AA, and uh, in my final crit, and Cedric was invited as a critic, and I had designed, um, and I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing, and, but I, I was pretty sure I was designing a mobile theatre amongst, a, across a sort of railway network <coughs> in and around Oxfordshire, Banbury, a whole bunch of sort of small, fairly defunct um, railway routes, and um, I hadn't really designed anything much, but I was pretty sure that there was something that was going to work across this site. Um, and I kept having to have meetings with structural engineers saying, well, what's it going to look like? And how's it, what's it going to be made of? And I, I don't know. I, just, I could only imagine a railway carriage with bits coming off of it. And they said, what's well, not the architecture? And are you sure this is what? So I, I was very, very dubious about the whole thing. And then Cedric came to the final quit and he said, hmm, it's not a bad idea. And, and, it, and of course, I hadn't, my teacher had never pointed me in the direction of this pottery thing called project, which I then subsequently realised was um, was what I was having a stab at. Um, but it, it was at that point that I realised that there was a completely different set of priorities um, that was one was able to kind of entertain in architecture. Um, and so I was very grateful to Cedric at that point because I really wasn't. It was the early 80s, well, sort of mid-80s. Uh, Postmodernism was um, rearing its large head and uh, I wasn't really very interested in it. Um, this was just a... The, I, I just found this and I thought it was quite amusing really in the, in the archive. Uh, this is Cedric's final report at the AA. He studied there in uh, 57 he graduated. With a, he was at Cambridge first and then went on to the AA. Um, and uh, it says, an interesting student who has plenty of ideas and many interests. It has probably been these interests that interfered with the work on his thesis. <laughs> this was not a not as fully studied and presented as it might have been. Nonetheless, during the year, he has reviewed and revised his ideas to advantage. He should develop into a good architect. So if anyone's had any reports vaguely like that, there is hope or not, depending on your view. Um, just to, this is where we are, a really horrible Google, this is really nasty, but just Cedric grew up, he, he, the Pottery Snakewell project, first Fun Pass was the big project when he set up his office in um, 1960, and then closely followed by the Pottery Snakewell project, and they, they both arose out of provocations that were sort of social and political um, provocations, and this particular project that I'm sure anyone who came to Stanley Matthews' lecture probably he related, but um, to repeat, uh, as Cedric would, he liked everything to be repeated quite often, but figuring that no one really heard it the first time. But um, Pottery's think that was, uh, it came out of a conversation with Lord Kennett, who was at the time in um, government, 1964, a minister, a minister of I'm not entirely sure what, he later became Minister of ed Education, but we're never quite sure exactly at the time. But there was a conversation about the whole um, university building programme at that period, um, and of which Cedric was very critical of. He felt it was another sort of just another iteration of the monasteries, but with rather nice, nicer plugs, um, and uh, possibly in a bit of nice landscape, which he felt could possibly have been put to better use. Um, so this was a, a sort of a conversation between himself and Lord Kennett, who then supports, you know, go, go on then, see if you can do better. Uh, which, of course, then Cedric did. Um, and the work on the whole project took, a, took um, a period of about nine months, 
so it's not very long. But um, being a very uh, self-motivated voter project, he went straight back to the area he knew very well, which was um, this entire area around Stoke on Trent, which is the five towns um, that comprise Stoke, along this sort of axis here. And he grew up, but was born and grew up in Stone. So this is this shows you a little bit the proximity to actually how well he did know the area. Um, his, he grew up in Stone. This is his father, who was an architect. Um, AJ is his father, and Jack was his uncle. He had two uncles. Uh, Jack was very much involved in the ceramics industry. He was a um, he was a potter, but on a, in a, an industrial scale and um, a figure that Cedric greatly admired um, in terms of a, his sort of social uh, views. And um, he did a lot of work to try to improve the conditions and the lot for all those working in the potteries at the time. Um, and these are some of the things he made. He actually worked primarily latterly out of the Bristol pottery, but that was a sort of, of the period. And he was a great one for testing glazes he was very keen on and, and Cedric's grandfather in fact had been to China he was also in the um, he'd been involved in buying colour for the ceramics industry and had been travelling to China um, at, in a very sort of early phase of developing um, glazes in in the, in the Stoke and Jack carried on that legacy of this is a particularly um, it does exist still in the family but as you can see it's rather tatty now and was very much a test piece um, of the 1920s. But back to the area, um, that's, the, that's sort of pretty well how it looks at the moment without the big numbers on it. And this is Cedric's um, plan, which you can see in the exhibition, but um, it covers that pretty well, that perfect triangle. Um, and the perfect triangle really uh, connects the three main stations or main routes or north, north, uh, west and south and, um, and from, this, from this map this is the kind of key to the whole project really because it shows every layer there are about 16 layers in the project and I think the key to sort of understanding or sort of getting a hang of, of one Cedric's work but also the project is this kind of total reordering of um, design priorities and concerns. And I think um, it's, Im it's just important to sort of see that, that, that very much as an architectural plan as well as a geographical plan. Um, because of the nature of the hierarchy of, which I'll go into in a little more detail in a while, but um, that this, the, the project itself was built up in layers, though the, the kind of major uh, transport interchanges at the, at the three corners and then the kind of minor um, and more directly related to the to the uh, learning activities on the routes themselves, and then a ha and then housing, which was a kind of subsequent or sort of byproduct, and probably the most important part of the project itself, which was a kind of uh, a byproduct, but actually the project, um, an un unexpected outcome in in some ways. So that that is a it's an important route. Um, what I meant to point out is one of the. Uh, included in the plan is Silverdale, and it's just another um, sort of indication of, of Cedric's closeness to the site. This is a drawing he did when he was nine. Um, he calls himself John, but I think he, as a child he was called John, that was his middle name. Um, uh, but he, Silverdale was one of the colliery towns, and, and it was, he renamed it Filthydale. Um, <laughs> but it gives a pretty good idea of really what it probably was like, or certainly would to grow up there, and his, certainly his view um, of, of the area. Um, and then this was this one of the site photographs that Stephen Mullen took on the first trip up to the site, um, which has a similar texture, I feel, and is a, is a photograph that you'll see um, integrated again into some of the pictures in the, in the exhibition. Um, there are overlays of drawings onto the site, and these are all photographs that were used um, for those drawings. Um, I want to read you something. I'm going to read you the sort of, I think, the, probably the most, uh, well, it's a pretty good, concise description of the project, um, which in this brilliant book, New Directions in British Architecture, I highly recommend it, by Roy Landau, 
who was, um, they don't really make books like this anymore, they're extremely succinct, everything's extremely wordy now, which I'm sure entirely down to our, I don't know why it's got that way, but anyway. Um, the Pottery Think Belt posits a higher educational system as a part of the national network of higher education facilities, specialising in science and technology. It proposes 20,000 students for a 100 square mile area of the potteries in North Staffordshire, an area which includes the now physically decaying industrial towns, once famed for Staffordshire pottery, but now recognisably less wealthy than the neighbouring West Midland region towns. In the study, education is characterised not as an independent and isolated service for students, but as an industry of national significance, generating here a population of at least 40,000 and having a major influence on the towns where it is located, to be located, and on the half million population living in this area. I'm going to carry on just a little bit. The importance of being able to accommodate the problem of change is a suitable hardware, as a suit, with a suitable hardware is basic to the Think Belt ph philosophy, which implies the need for seriously questioning that time-honoured attitude to, to an architectural cornerstone principle which equates design excellence with top quality last, long-lasting materials. So this, so that's the kind of crux of it, really. Um, Cedric, the, the, the sort of key concepts in Cedric's work um, are all played out here. And I suppose what I will get on to um, is then to show really how they are played out through all his projects in some version or another. Um, this is a drawing that I found, which, as you can see, is dated 1983, but I think it's a pretty good diagram of, of the potteries. Um, but it, it was produced for another project much later. Um, but it, it's, it's a, a mode of drawing that um, he used a lot. It's a drawing from one of his sketch, his notebooks. He didn't call them sketchbooks, he called them notebooks. Um, and it was very much for himself as a reminder. So this is a little A6 drawing, just to give you an idea. Um, so this is a reminder drawing, and a reminder that, it, that to think about mobility, to think about time, to think about logistics. Um, this is another reminder drawing in one of his um, notebooks, which is a reminder of the state, the, the, the point in time in which he's working. Um, and he's enjoying the scrambled part. Um, he's remi this is another reminder. Um, it's a reminder actually that comes up in a, in a brief, a student brief, which was published. Um, so it's really a reminder to himself and then the students. Um, and it's also a reminder from his friend, uh, Buckminster Fuller, who he, he worked with. Uh, he sort of worked with. They had conversations together. They didn't really work together, but they certainly talked and communicated um, a lot. And so this is a reminder about to think about uh, infrastructure and not about fancy nozzles which is the best description of architecture I've ever heard. Um, another reminder, history of place, not some nostalgia of moment. Um, that was absolutely some, a concern of Cedric's, and he was a, a, um, his knowledge of British history was phenomenal. Um, but his, uh, and therefore the kind of understanding of, a, of, of chains of events and what, is, what, what becomes relevant and in, irrelevant at particular moments in time whether that's uh, political, social, cultural, um, but it's uh, never to, to wear your heart on your sleeve for, for the satisfaction of the moment. Um, and then the use of a drawing of this kind, which is a highly composed drawing. It's become a sort of icon of Pottery's Think Belt. Um, and, and, and I think Cedric's fully intended it to be, and subsequently have found the, some of the sketches that um, he made to, to prepare that for what ended up actually on the cover of, of architectural design as the sort of image, the image of potteries. But um, that idea of sitting in, in, inside the cabin of the train on arrival at, at one of the um, transfer areas and uh, that split second of time of what you would see, what would be on, what would be off, um, and very much with the, con with the notion of inter an interior, which is, ex is, is about as close as you get with any Cedric project. Um, 
but the interior is all about the view out. And then the use of, of publications, which were, were critical to him and, and, and a key, key to understanding how he worked, I think. Um, everything that I, I found quite recently, a list of, of kinds of drawings that Cedric made. And he made uh, the in-head drawings, which are those notebook drawings, um, the in-house drawings, which were all the, the drawings that everybody does to work things out and produce for, um, for making things. Um, and then there are the in forward minded retrospect drawings. And I think in that category, he meant anything that was published. Because at that moment of being able to publish, one could entirely compose a project and, and rethink it and re, um, possibly re strategize, um, which he was fully in command of and understood the, the value of that. And I asked Steve Mullen recently about Cedric's diagrams. There are a lot of diagrams in his work. And I said, you know, how did Cedric, did he you start with a diagram and then develop from the diagram? Or did he, how did he, was it constant? He went, no, 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 he always did them last. Mm -hmm. So it was always for the benefit of a clarity of communication. Um, so there was, so you get, uh, of which New Society, um, and also to, to make the point that New Society was not an architecture magazine, it was the first time that Pottery Sink Bell was published. Um, and that again was very strategic, it was in a kind of socio political context. And then uh, almost a year later, it then came out in architectural design um, and quite, in quite a different form. Um, and certainly the text re reads quite differently. Um, and then back to the, the sort of reminders to yourself. And this again is from, from another project altogether. It was from uh, Montreal Olympic uh, project in the 70s. Um, but it was about, uh, again, about a sort of communications network across the city and how you kind of, uh, how to, again, at a time, you know, before internet, I have to keep reiterating, but we're actually in that time with it. Um, you know, the, the, all of technology was, is, is clunky, it's very clunky. Um, but he's thinking about devices. What are these devices which become uh, our design responses to that notion of how do you build up a communication network across a city or a place? And, and they're very present large objects, um, which have a, as you can see, are as puzzling to him as they are to possibly us. Um, so back to the site. And this um, sort of looking beyond the kind of formal qualities of, of architecture and, and more to do with the of quality of urban life. I and mean, that was really uh, what interested Cedric. And, and in, the, in the architectural design um, article, he calls, he calls the, the, the sort of that, that interest or that idea life conditioning. And it comes up a lot in Cedric's work. He talks about uh, architecture as something that should be life conditioning. It is not there to, to be a burden on its citizens. Um, so this, yes, I'm just wondering whether I should read. Yes, I want to read this one of the little bit. <coughs> and this is, um, this was actually in the New Society article, which is about well, you've got this, this part is called the right priorities. And the project, the project indicates that education and the need to exchange information may be able to equal defense, energy, and commerce, and commerce needs as generators of urban location and form, cities caused by learning. However, the current analogy between existing universities and the ideal town, form, the ideal town forms is both false and dangerous. Houses partly for students and partly for the local inhabitants, are integral to the project. At the first stage of development, civic design is avoided. This is the right order of priorities. So he's, he's got the concept of a city in mind. He has the concept of higher education in mind. And he has a site. And really, that's, those are the ingredients. And then what comes out of that is, is this arrangement across the site of, um, of how to organize that. So there, we've got Maidley 
is over there, Mir is here, and at the top is Pitt's Hill, which you'll remember from the model, I'm sure. Um, Maidley has road and rail, Mir has flight road and rail, and Pitt's Hill has road and rail, of varying degrees of, of uh, extent. So he, that, that kind of becomes the first layer of, of uh, logistics, really. So, so Maidley is all about um, bringing heavy goods in. And the, the ho- I, I know I have failed to say this, but it's very intrinsic to the, to the plan for the higher education was, was the integration with industry and, and how that was, would be not really resuscitated, but started to, to, to germinate something else. The area at that time had completely, was pretty well depleted in terms of the existing industries. Um, hence the, the starting of the Keele University, and, the, and that is a kind of way of initiating. And I think the, the kind of locating of Maidley very close to Keele University was very pointed, uh, possibly pointed, and that was a kind of heavy goods um, area. Uh, I think it was sort of well positioned, but um, this idea that the kind of that, that education would come very closely with with industry that was that was occurring in the area that would start to develop. So this was a, essentially a big um, experiment place for experimenting for uh, laboratories and the little towers on the edge were for for staff to live in. Um, and, the, and a, a, a plan of that, um, which, which shows the, the sort of general uh, testing ground and then a kind of open area with moving gantry cranes where um, experiments could be assembled or disassembled, but on a large scale. Um, and I think probably the most useful drawing actually is the section. And this is the thing that, that reoccurs in all of the parts of the project as, as this kind of layering up of activity. And it's, it's also endemic, I think, in, in the project itself. It's a constant kind of layering and, and exchange of, of varying activities, whether it's to do with accommodation, teaching, uh, logistics, testing, um, movement. But they're always side by side. Um, then there was Mir with the, with the air, airport, which is sort of slightly, um, was for sort of lighter goods and had, had more connection with the kind of international network and that notion that it was connected to the, to the rest of the world. Um, and again, a plan, which is, the, I mean, it, it, all of these drawings are sort of levels of diagram, which um, is the kind of great frustration, I find, in looking at the work and, and the great puzzle that keeps one wanting to look at it. And I think that's what's again, is so fantastic about the model and this kind of great in, uh, addition to the project is that it suddenly um, makes solid parts of the drawings that really aren't solid at all. They're never solid. They're always open. And I think very deliberately so. Um, so hopefully we can start to read some of the model images against the drawings, which I think actually starts to help to illuminate. And then hopefully somebody starts to redraw them all together. Um, because the one thing that really is, again, I think that the, the model as well, because, uh, we had a, I had a conversation with Barnabas earlier, who was very worried that it kind of um, objectifies this um, project, which is very non-object. Um, and, and I think there's no shame in that at all. I think it's actually r- the right thing to do. Because I think, I mean, I, Cedric left it very open. I mean, as well as it was worked out and calculated in, in many ways, I think there, is, there, there are huge parts of it which we just don't know about. And I, I firmly believe that the only way you find out is really by making it or drawing it. Um, and the Pitts Hill area, which is the, this bridging of the va- it sits on part of the valley and bridges over to the other side. And this is a sort of move sliding bridge. Um, which goes across, you can just about see in the very long, thin sections in the middle. Um, and these very open-ended plans, which, again, have no beginning and end, I think deliberately so. More diagrams, more dotted lines. Master of the dotted line. Back to the plan, and I can't remember why. Yes, the pro- the. The transfer is then the sort of second layer of these what we call faculty areas, which are these sort of black blobs. There's a black blob there, one there, 
Um, and these are the sort of more defined <coughs> teaching areas, in a sense, or places where railway carriages could come uh, up to sidings. There would be opportunity, opportunities in the landscape where, next to the railway sidings where he could develop or, or, or allocate space for um, railway carriages to, to stop and unfold or meet another carriage um, and hook up uh, or um, switch, switch t types. Again, they're fairly sketchy. They're, they're very diagrammatic, all in sort of almost capsule and carriage form. But these are the train tracks. In each instance, you can see the train tracks. And on top of the train tracks, you have railway carriages of various different compartments. Here is a, a sort of pod which we never quite know how, where it comes from or where it goes, but it's a lecture theatre which opens up and closes. Here's one which has sort of begun to unfold and has inflatable parts um, for bigger meetings, bigger discussions, uh, fold-out parts so that you could have an outdoor area or an indoor part, um, and here a sort of meeting of, of tracks where you could start to sidle up or, or start to compile bigger structures, um, albeit for a short period of time before it moves off. And that was a sort of ideal faculty area. Again, this kind of layering of activities across uh, the tracks and, and a meeting of those at one point and then a moving away. And again, I, th I sort of, um, I think that the drawings are insufficient. They really don't show the project as, as they should. Um, there's still too much description, I think. Maybe I'm talking too much, but I think there's, it, it, because it's implicit in, uh, implicit in the project is that it is mobile, it is entirely determined by time and the use of time and speed, and he talks about time but doesn't really talk about the speed um, in which these activities may occur, that a whole, it, it, it suggests a whole array of other kinds of drawings that would describe that. Um, but but I, clearly that wasn't really... Well, maybe he ran out of time, I don't know. The project ended, he had to get on and get another job. So the diagrams are there. Then there's the housing, which um, on the back on that map, there, it appears in little clusters, and there are sort of first and second phases of housing, and there were four types, um, which again are shown as little white pieces on the model. Um, but they did vary in form. They're still relatively diagrammatic. Some are slightly more developed than others. But I think this was the real... Uh, this is a, a scale of interest that really uh, did interest Cedric. Um, and and the, the names of all the houses, as Steve Mullen and I dare say, um, mentioned when he came, were really to get up the nose of the ROBA. They, they thought of the most irritating names, all the things that um, would just make horrify them, um, but they delighted. And this was sort of typical of, of the way that the office operated. Um, and the way that Cedric operated, always putting himself in counterpoint to his profession, um, never allying himself too closely, um, always befriended others, never architect. Um, and the, the naming is, is just a part of that uh, way of, uh, that part of that behavior, I would say. Um, so battery housing was uh, a sort of sandwich, really. Again, sections of, um, I find more useful to the, than the plans because the plans, I, I still have difficulty with these ones, but these are essentially a sandwich of space frame and with the housing in the middle. Um, and the space frame below is for parking and the above for promenading across the top and possibly parking. Um, and then the space in between sort of divided up um, willy-nilly uh, and for for students and on the pre on the premise that the students would only ever be there for two to three years so um, and this is a sort of cutaway section of that with space frame at the bottom some of the the sort of partitioned up space in between and then the kind of space frame part on the top and for, with all the services running in those um, space frame structures. And one of the rare views that said, I think the, the view from the train and this one about the only sort of visualizations that Cedric <laughs> ever made of the project, there are some um, views on the site of some of the 
which are, 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 are fairly iconic images, I would say, of the project, which I'm not showing, um, on the basis that I never, I, again, I find them really unsatisfactory. They're line drawings on top of a photograph, so they're, they're sort of ghostly images, and I, I find them pretty non-committal and difficult. Anyway, I think this is a, a, a strange but helpful image, actually. A rare, a rare opportunity for Cedric to, or a moment where he decided he would just show us what he sort of thought it might look like, um, as reluctant as he was. Um, but and I still quite quite I think this person must be in the dentist or something. I don't really know what they're doing, but um, he's imagining something there. And then capsule housing, which were very much like caravans, really. Um, uh, they were sort of individual occupancy. And, and the nature of all the housing was that it was, it was specific to different kinds of site. So um, the capsule and the uh, battery housing were for, for relatively stable locations. Um, but this again was for individual occupancy, the caravans that sort of more or less adapted. He would hate it, I'm sure, if I called them caravans, but that's really what they were, steel uh, frame with fiberglass um, casings. and and endlessly flexible occupation. Um, and this rather fine diagram, I think, of how they may be laid out, but the idea being that they all would all have a view. So they, might, they, were, they were all orientated in a particular way, um, this sort of branching system that they would have a view, and how you might park your car, or your car was more or less almost like your house. And then the crate housing, which was, um, as, were again sort of capsules, but these were multi-storey and held in a, in a concrete frame and then loaded in and out, very much like um, a lot of the other iconic capsule housing of the time in Japan and um, David Green's living pod comes to mind here. David Green actually designed a multi-storey uh, tower for his living pods, not dissimilar to this. There was a sort of loose steel tower where the pods would be loaded in and out. Um, across the system, but this was, for, again, for relatively stable uh, ground. And then sprawl housing, which I think, I get the feeling was their favorite, um, partly because of the word sprawl, which I'm sure was really the worst they could think of. Um, but there was something that really interested Cedric in that idea. Um, and I don't think he, uh, I'm pretty certain he didn't mean it in the sense that it was uncontrolled sprawl, but there was some notion that um, housing would would fall where it needed to fall, and this certainly could because it was designed to sit on uh, sort of adjustable legs. Um, so it was very good for it was a timber frame, uh, basic timber frame and clad, and then um, uh, arranged along these sort of branch mechanisms so that servicing uh, in the number five pods there, there would be wet services, heat, uh, light um, would would serve as a, a cluster of, of sprawl houses. And they could deal with pretty well any kind of terrain, and the terrain there was really very um, f very fragile um, because of previous industry. So there were fantastic areas of just sort of sagging ground and very loose ground, and, and this was designed to, to cope with those conditions. Um, and this very odd diagram, which he describes as, as in an um, arrangement for an, a particularly inhospitable area. So I don't. I think the the circles of the houses. It's a bit like sort of wagons circling, with their backs to something. And I don't quite know what the squiggly line is. But if anyone can figure it out, I'd be really. It's a nice drawing there. Um, and this is a sort of suggestion that how they might be uh, adjoined to the um, battery housing. So that's a battery unit, and that's a sprawl. Um, but that I think key to to all of them. Is um, is that they all tread, they trod very very lightly on the ground. They were entirely independent of any um, national grid or services. All the services could float above the ground, um, and that was uh, I think Cedric's real excitement that that's how how one could deal with huge amounts of um, development that was happening just because of the because of the in, in integrated. Uh, drainage system and power systems that that then determined patterning of of housing thereafter and it could never it couldn't change because of that um, and I just show a quick 
picture of Levittown in Long Island, which is actually designed prior to this 47 to 51, um, but I think has been pointed to, to as a kind of possible, what might it look like? I'm not sure it would look like that, but you know, that's what happens when you design across a lot. I don't think it would look like this, because I don't think Cedric, he's quite clear that the, the sort of areas of development were, and never get to be that big, because as soon as they get to be very big, or there, there are so many houses, the, the, the need changes, so then it dissolves and moves. Um, so very briefly, because I know we're running out of time, um, I just wanted to show some of the other projects um, that Cedric was doing, uh, some at the time and later, but, but where these sorts of ideas um, run across other projects. This was something that followed on quite soon after, which was a competition for Steel House and, and a whole body of housing research um, that he did. And so that was a, still the preoccupations with um, steel panel design, prefabrication, portability, mobility, um, how to design off-site and bring it on, on site were all things, preoccupations. And then a, a rare glimpse into him actually thinking what they might, how they might get decorated. I think he quite liked the idea of decoration, actually. And there are one or two projects later that certainly indicate that. But I think in, in a rare moment where he allowed, um, he did think about how they may be adorned, but I think probably by their, resi their occupants, possibly. Um, but it clearly, uh, interested him to go through that sort of um, process of thinking about what they and, and uh, necessary, I think. And then, uh, parallel to that, was a sort of interest. Again, this is very close to, um, or to subsequently to the Pottery Sink project. Um, Cedric went to the States, um, was invited to America on a, an, on a number of occasions in the sort of mid 60s. Um, to this area, particularly in Detroit and Pontiac, which is the kind of big square at the top, um, to look at, uh, well, it's, it's the, the point where the car industry is beginning to, you know, fragment and uh, Detroit is becoming um, a difficult place to be, enormous poverty uh, really starting to kick in and a system of education which isn't um, fulfilling the requirements, and so he proposes um, Think Grid. That project is called Think Grid, and there's this kind of notion of um, of really, as he as he draws very explicitly, parachuting in technology into an area and devising a system where um, technology can be available across um, a, a wide district, which will start to kind of generate um, a system of of learning and self-learning. And then another project, which is um, um, with a student charrette in the States, again, called Atom, and where the, a list is made of all the kind of, um, the kit. I mean, this is the architecture. These are the components for his, for, for his architecture. And, and the components for a kind of system of um, learning. And, the, and they come up with what sort of looks like a fun palace, I think, a bit. Uh, this is not a Cedric drawing, um, it's a, I think one of the students on the charrette uh, who, who's characterized, caricatured Cedric in his, on the screen there. But there's this kind of notion that there's a, there's a kind of concentrate of, of uh, media and communicate, systems of communication. It runs, a, it, it spans the railroad, it spans the highway. Um, there's this kind of convergence of uh, modes of communication and then it kind of disseminates into um, information being fed through other systems like the bus network and into people's cars individually and um, so again the kind of uh, dissemination of that no of, of knowledge and learning um, and then a kind of another example which is the Oxford Corner House project um, which uh, Again, a, around the same sort of time, but a, a client coming to him. The Lions, Lions Corner House was a, a very, very successful um, catering outfit who had huge uh, numbers of tea houses and coffee houses and restaurants in London. Um, and this one is partic in particular is on the site on the corner of Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Street. 
uh, which then became Virgin Megastore and something else. Um, but uh, the whole fashion for going and having tea and going to restaurants sort of dissolved, and the client wanted to, to know what to do next. And, and um, another very good, he was called Patrick Salmon, and it was kind of very uh, a good example of how um, Cedric's relationship was, being such a charismatic individual, his relationship with clients was always very personal, and there was always a person at the head of the company that he would um, become very, very great friends with. Um, but as soon as that person moved in the company, or somebody did, else in the company decided that wasn't really what they wanted, the project tended to fall apart, and I think it, it, this reoccurs a lot. And it's always leveled that Cedric just didn't want to build and actually, I, that's rubbish. He really wanted to build. Every project is pretty well designed to the point where it could be designed further to go and build, or to the point of being detailed. Um, it just tended to be his kind of Achilles heel was this, uh, maybe it wasn't a heel, I don't know, but it, it was this, the relationships he built up with clients were, were, were personal. But so on the one hand, he, it sort of initiated interesting projects. Uh, but tended never to happen. Uh, but Oxford Corner House was then, so Cedric sees this, I think this is the first internet cafe. Um, it was 1967, and uh, so the conception is for a, a, a place, a multi-story place where you could make TV shows, you could dial up uh, any information from um, any news broadcast around the world. It was, it was connected to all of the communication systems that were available in London. These are two sections through the building. Um, it had movable floors, hydraulic floors, so that you could change the space in which to, so that it could become a place to perform. A sort of mini fun palace, but, but with more communications. Um, and that kind of notion that it would be connected to the rest of the world and that you could go there and, and um, dial up anywhere in the world um, and use it as a, as a means of, of learning, as a system of learning and um, Cedric's archive is full of newspaper cuttings. Every, every project comes laden with, an, with a batch of newspaper cuttings because he always kept his eye on what was going on. He's always responding. He's not trying to solve anything. He doesn't problem solve. He, he responds. He always responds to what's going on. Um, and this particular strategy for for turning a lot of the turning schools into film studios essentially so that then it, it could be a system of shared learning if you were having a history lesson over in East London I could be in the history lesson too in, in uh, Brighton so he was conscious of the technologies um, much later Frankfurt um, a, a, again, invited by the, tend to be invited by, much later on in the sort of late 80s and, and early 90s, invited by cities to come and, and look at a, a kind of city strategy, the scrambled egg problem. Um, and this was Frankfurt where uh, there was a university in the centre of the city and, and how to, 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 to conceptualise that really in terms of, a, of the town as a, as a, a redevelopment of the town. And Cedric um, looks at it on the scale of individual buildings, how that might be added or connected, it connect existing, always looking at what existed and how to link, how to make links between parts of cities and parts of sites and areas that were formerly disconnected. Um, and he describes it, the little corner sketch, describes it as a blanket of learning, warm, tucked in, and for, I can't read the rest of his writing spread generously, but, but generally the, the notion that it would be by linking parts that previously were, what, were disconnected, um, one could generate another patterning in a city. And similarly for Strasbourg, um, strasbourg Kell, a, a, a European border crossing, um, and where there was sort of huge disconnect, mostly because of the kind of uh, highways being cut through, which were always seen as a major problem, um, that, that transport networks kind of cut through old cities. Uh, but he, he saw this as a great opportunity to connect highway and railway and industrial part and Dockland area um, by um, 
proposing what he says is that Cook describes as the Stratton saucer. But I think it's just because it happened to be a paper plate that he was drawing on. But I think conceptually, it goes back to the original drawing. You know, the circle is there. These kind of connects of of how to um, to start to 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 connect parts of the cities which are, are totally disconnected. And so this notion of a saucer, which would have the capacity to shelter, create viewpoints, identity at distance, so that it may be so the saucer might be something that you see when you're whizzing down the highway. It might be something that also operates to cover something. Um, it, it suggests all sorts of responses and, and possibly solutions. Um, and then at the other end of the scale, thinking about well, what happens as a saucer flying above Strasbourg, and then what happens on the ground. So he's, there's always, again, these drawings occur in his notebook, so the, 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 the simultaneous pages. So on the one hand, he's thinking on the kind of um, city scale, and then on the other um, end of the scale, what happens when it meets the ground. And those opportunities at, at the ground um, are, as he says, the feet have it. That's the point that actually is, is a concern, a design concern. And then what happens when you try to draw a section through it? Um, again, it's, a, it's a, him reminding himself that you're operating on a number of different uh, transport communication levels, also uh, terrain levels um, and speed. And water, there's a bit of water there too. So how do you integrate water and uh, devices that live on water as part of that architecture? And he's sort of trying to describe some um, sliding bridge or linking bridge. And all in the pursuit of avo avoiding the tight, finite city, kind of look, trying to, to figure out what that scrambled egg might be like. Um, and I think this is a, it's probably the most useful sketch, actually, but it does describe this idea that for the, the different points of, uh, and again, in his kind of, um, it's the, the joy of having very few lines, and he was an extremely good cartoonist, and I mean that in the best, you know, the best cartoonists uh, can put a point across with very few lines and possibly one word, and you understand exactly what it means, and it, sometimes it's not quite as easy always with Cedric because you, there's the vocabulary that you get into, but, but at the same time I think he, he's pretty close, um, and this is a quite a rough one, but uh, he's linking sport, industry, learning, city, um, or citizens rather, um, and, and thinking how to strategize that in phases and in stages and physically and um, a mammoth task. And then I'm going to finish, you'll be pleased to hear, on one drawing, which is my favourite drawing. Um, and it's for a project uh, called Turkland. And it was, um, he, Cedric was invited to uh, former Yugoslavia, this was late 80s, uh, to this tiny, very small hill town. Uh, and the uh, citizens wanted to uh, propose how to become connected. The, the question was how to become connected with the rest of the world. Um, and so Cedric proposed this halo over the city, um, which is a, essentially a kind of uh, a Wi-Fi. It's, that's what a Wi-Fi looks like. It's a bundle of cables and, and something that radiates electronic energy and connectivity. And the idea that it would um, it would physically be there. Also, there's a physical presence. It's jacked up on these cranes, and it, it's raised and lowered according to need. And if not needed at all, it can be driven away. Um, so the architecture, his architecture, doesn't touch the site at all, and it's only there if you if it's required. Um, but I think I partly I love the drawing because I love the drawing. And it says a lot about Cedric. It combines two kinds of his drawing, which are these very soft pencil lines. And he, there are pages and pages of his notebooks, which are him looking out of windows of trains, um, which he does a lot, and always drawing the landscape, wondering what it looks like. Um, and then this other drawing, which is with his ink pen, um, to try to describe his architecture. Um, 
which is not easy to describe, um, but I think it's very suge it's suggestive, and I think it gets very close in this one. And um, I think there was one little bit I will read, which is before I do shut up. Um, which is something that Cedric said. There was an exhibition of the Pottery Sink Belt, a completely different exhibition, in uh, Madrid about seven years ago, I think. Um, and Cedric went, would it have been, yeah, about seven or eight years ago. Um, and Cedric went and gave a talk at the end, and he said, the only point to look at this exhibition is for you to glean points that you yourself find useful, <coughs> and you can translate in your own work whether you're a politician, an architect, or a citizen. And that is the only reason why old drawings, old bits of architecture, they could be drawings, they could be buildings, that's the only point of their usefulness today. And that is because they exist today. Ideas exist today. Thank you very much. <laughs>